Greetings, and thank you for joining me for another one of my talks. In this talk, I will discuss the performance so far of Western tanks in Ukraine. Throughout 2023, unsubstantiated, unintelligent and infantile claims were made by Western mainstream journalists and Western so-called experts concerning the implications of the arrival in Ukraine of Western supplied tanks. Specifically, it was said that the supply of American M1 Abrams tanks, German Leopard 2 tanks, and British Challenger 2 tanks to the Ukrainian army would tilt the fighting in Ukraine in favour of the Ukrainians. A game changer, which added to the long list of previous game changers which had been proclaimed by Western mainstream journalists and Western so called experts, and which had utterly and miserably failed to come about in the war in Ukraine. The claim that a handful of Western tanks would constitute a game changer in the fighting in Ukraine is one of the most idiotic of claims made in the history of modern warfare and, indeed, in the history of warfare in general. Just think about it. 31 M1 Abrams tanks, 71 Leopard 2 tanks, and 14 Challenger 2 tanks would change the course of a war which is being fought on a 1,000 kilometre long front line. A most deranged claim. Furthermore, the moronic claim was also based on an assumption that Western tanks would be impervious to Russian weaponry and the terrain in Ukraine. As I said throughout 2023, the claim was made by people either living in La La Land or being paid to say so. Before I proceed to assessing the performance of Western tanks in Ukraine, it is essential for me to make two observations about the significance or insignificance of these tanks on the battlefields of Ukraine. Firstly, for Western tanks to produce effective results in Ukraine, the Ukrainian army would have to be supplied with hundreds, if not thousands, of these machines, and supplied on a regular basis because of the inevitable numbers which would either be destroyed or disabled or captured by the Russians. And the chances of such a scenario materialising are non-existent, because A, America, Germany and Britain do not, themselves, have sufficient numbers of these tanks to give to the Ukrainian army, especially Germany and Britain. B, American, German and British armaments factories, especially the latter two, do not have the capacity to produce large volumes of tanks for the Ukrainian army and replenish the stockpiles of the Ukrainian army. C. These tanks need to be operated by men, and the Ukrainian military, after two years of war, is in short supply of men, owing to the enormous losses of Ukrainian servicemen in the war. To date, the Ukrainian military has incurred over 1.5 million casualties, including over 500,000 killed. Thus, even if hundreds or thousands of Western tanks were supplied to Ukraine, the Ukrainian military does not have anywhere near sufficient numbers of men to operate these machines. And D, if the West was to send hundreds or thousands of Western tanks to the Ukrainian army, then Russia would respond by sending double or more of its own tanks to Ukraine to meet the threat. As they did in the war with Nazi Germany, and as they are doing today in the war with NATO's Ukrainian army, Russian armaments factories are able to sustain the Russian armed forces indefinitely at a time of war. 
such as the gigantic size of the Russian military industrial complex. And as I said in a previous talk, Russia has only used in Ukraine between 12 and 15 percent of its total military might. Accordingly, the enormity of the situation in Ukraine facing the Ukrainian military and its patron, NATO, is clear for all to see. By merely deploying in Ukraine between 12 and 15 percent of its overall capacity for war, Russia has inflicted over 1.5 million losses on the Ukrainian military, has destroyed many thousands of Ukrainian and Western weapons of war, such as tanks and infantry fighting vehicles, and has depleted the stockpiles of Western countries such as America, Canada and Britain. The devastating losses which the Russian military has inflicted on its Ukrainian counterpart and its patron, NATO, should not surprise anyone, let alone shock anyone. After all, Russia is a military superpower. I will now turn to the performance to date of Western tanks in Ukraine. Leading up to and then immediately after the deployment to Ukraine of Western tanks, there was sensational talk by Western mainstream journalists and Western so-called experts of how these tanks would enter into duels with their Russian counterparts. That talk was yet another demonstration of how those people are charlatans masquerading as experts. Firstly, for there to be tank battles, there has to be large concentrations of tank forces either side of the front line facing each other in confined areas. So far in the war in Ukraine, that has not occurred, owing in part to how Russia vastly outnumbers the Ukrainian army in tanks. Accordingly, the Ukrainians have spread their tanks in penny packet formations along the entire front line, some of which are dug in, while others are mobile. Thus, there can be no tank battles in light of the current numbers and deployment of Ukrainian tanks. And secondly, given that the Russian army vastly outnumbers the Ukrainian army in tanks, with the situation becoming ever worse for the Ukrainians on a monthly basis, the task of destroying tanks has fallen all the more so to helicopter gunships, artillery, tank hunting units comprised of soldiers armed with handheld anti-tank weapons and drones. As regards the latter, the war in Ukraine will be known in the annals of military history as the conflict which heralded the use of tank attacking drones, ushering in a new and major dimension to modern warfare. Since the deployment to Ukraine of Western tanks, the Russians have destroyed, disabled and captured numerous M1 Abrams, Leopard 2 and Challenger 2 tanks, something which was a foregone conclusion. Those tanks overwhelmingly fell victim to Russian helicopter gunships, Russian artillery, Russian tank hunting units and Russian drones. Despite the very thick armour on M1 Abrams, Leopard 2 and Challenger 2 tanks, the Russians have, by all accounts, neutralised these machines with relative ease. Thus, the notion that those tanks are invincible, as put out by Western mainstream journalists and so-called Western experts, has been obliterated and is burning fiercely, just like the burning hulks of the actual tanks themselves on the battlefield in Ukraine. Turning now to how Western tanks have fared on the terrain in Ukraine, well, the answer is poorly.
mainly on account of their immense weight and their overall sophisticated design and components, M1 Abrams, Leopard 2 and Challenger 2 tanks have often become immobilised after having sunk into fertile black soil, Chernozem, which the eastern and southern regions of Ukraine are historically known for. The problem is so serious that this is one of the reasons as to why the Ukrainian army deploys its western tanks only occasionally. That western tanks are encountering serious problems with the inhospitable terrain in Ukraine brings me appropriately to my next submission. Namely, that western tank designers have failed to learn from the mistakes of German tank designers from 1942 to 1945. The German Tiger tanks, Tiger I and Tiger II, and the German Panther tanks, Panther I and Panther II, were lethal machines. With thick armour and extremely powerful guns, Germany's Tiger and Panther tanks were, in some respects, without equal in World War II. In essence, the Tigers and the Panthers were potent adversaries whose designs influenced subsequent generations of tanks. However, three of the main flaws of the Tigers and the Panthers were their size, weight and production costs. Given how large the, the German tanks were, this presented enemy combatants with a large target to fire at. While the immense weight of their tanks sometimes rendered them cumbersome and sometimes resulted in them becoming stuck in mud. Finally, the production costs of the German tanks was considerable. Opposing the German tanks on the Eastern Front from 1942 to 1943 was the Soviet T-34 tank, while from 1942 to 1945 it was the T-34 with an 85mm gun. Whilst the Tigers and the Panthers comprised more powerful guns and thicker armour than the T-34, the T-34 was lighter, hence faster, more manoeuvrable and not as prone to getting stuck in mud. Furthermore, the T-34 was cheap to produce and straightforward for crews to operate. In the contest on the Eastern Front, the T-34 proved to be victorious over the Panthers and the Tigers. Now, fast forward to the war in Ukraine. There are distinct, distinct similarities between the Western tanks there and the Tigers and Panthers of the Second World War. The initial observation is that the M1 Abrams, Leopard 2 and Challenger 2 tanks bear an external resemblance to the Tigers and the Panthers. Then there is the large size and heavy weight of the M1 Abrams, Leopard 2 and Challenger 2 tanks. Finally, there are the very considerable production costs per unit of an M1 Abrams, Leopard 2 and Challenger 2 tank. Now, whilst the Abram, Leopard and Challenger tanks are, overall, highly effective and potent machines. They are, in a number of ways, flawed, and this has been demonstrated in Ukraine. They are simply too large and too heavy, making them sometimes cumbersome and prone to getting stuck in mud, especially the Challenger 2 tanks. And the sheer production cost per Abrams, Leopard and Challenger is a severe limitating factor in how many can be produced and sent to the Ukrainian army.
Opposing the Abrams, Leopards and Challengers in Ukraine are the Russian T-72, T-80, T-90 and T-14 tanks. Whilst there have been very few direct engagements between Western and Russian tanks in Ukraine, simply because there are only a handful of Western tanks in Ukraine, the Ukrainian army is mostly comprised of T-64s and T-72s, from the engagements there have been, it appears that the Russian tanks have emerged victorious. Indeed, Bulgarian military sources report that a Russian upgraded T-72, a T-72B3, recently destroyed an M1 Abrams in a duel. Like the legendary T-34 tank, the T-72, T-80, T-90 and T-14 tanks are light, fast, relatively cheap to produce and straightforward to operate, as well as being powerful and lethal. And it is those characteristics which are giving Russian tanks the upper hand over their Western counterparts in Ukraine. Thus, that Western tank designers have made the same mistakes as German tank designers from 1942 to 1945 in believing that bigger and heavier is better. In some ways, the M1 Abrams, Leopard 2 and Challenger 2 tanks are more powerful than their Russian counterparts. But speed, maneuverability, numbers and the ability to cope with Eastern European terrain, combined with powerful guns, won the contest for the Russian tank in World War II and is, so far, winning the contest for the Russian tank in Ukraine. Thank you, as always, for listening.